This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Check out Squarespace through the link in the description below. More on them in a bit. It's one of the biggest boom towns of the last century. A hundred years ago, Dubai was a sleepy 10,000 person trading post surrounded by deserts. By 1990, it was a mid sized oil hub just building its very first high rises. Then, suddenly, everything exploded. Within five years, a construction spree had started that was so intense that it was unrivaled even in the oil-rich Middle East. Gigantic malls appeared, seven-star hotels sprouted up, indoor ski resorts opened in the middle of the desert. By the time the Burj Khalifa was declared to be the world's tallest structure in 2007, it was clear Dubai had transformed. Out had gone the sands and history, in had come glass, steel, man's overwhelming wealth. But how did this happen? How did this minor emirate huddled beside the hulking might of oil-rich Abu Dhabi and Saudi Arabia become one of the greatest cities in the world? And, well, has its fall already begun? Today, Geographics is digging into both the legendary past of Dubai, as well as taking a peek into its future to uncover the secrets of the Gulf's greatest metropolis. When you look at Dubai today, it's tempting to think, hmm, this place looks pretty damn new. But while most of modern Dubai did indeed only appear in the last 30 years, its history stretches way, way back. All the way back into the ancient world, in fact. It was here on these shores several thousand years ago that the seeds of the emirate were first sown. As far back as 10,000 BC, humans appeared in what we now call the Gulf States. In those days, the region looked a little bit different. Instead of desert, you had sweeping grasslands and coasts ringed by mangrove swamps. You wouldn't have guessed it at the time, but one of those swamps would eventually become Dubai. The kernel of the Dubai settlement appeared first around 3000 BC. As the region got hotter, the mangrove swamps, they shriveled up. Initially, it was nomadic herders who moved into the site of modern Dubai. But by 2500 BC, a date palm plantation and a small trading center had been established. That center is important because the Gulf in this era, it thrived on trade. In ancient Amman and Bahrain, empires had sprung up, specializing in copper and luxury goods that they traded with one another. Part of that trade involved passing through Dubai, allowing the small settlement to prosper. Although the two empires collapsed by the Second millennium BC, the die had been cast. Dubai would spend the next four millennia tangled in a trade network covering everything from Indian spices to Chinese porcelain. But it wouldn't be anywhere near the center of this network. After its ancient neighbors collapsed, Dubai just vanished from the history books. We know it was still there, poodling along thanks to archaeological finds like a 4th century caravan station that suggested the settlement still thrived on passing trade. But actual historical records? Well, sadly, they just don't exist. And this is sad because it must have been a fascinating time for the small merchant settlements. In the early 7th century, the forces of the Prophet Muhammad swept across Arabia, creating a new Muslim empire. Dubai undoubtedly had a front seat to all of the action. But we'll never know how this world-changing event affected its people because, well, no accounts survive. All that we have to go on are the remains of a mosque from around the time of the end of the first millennium AD, which shows the dramatic way the area transformed. Dubai's absence from the historical record, it finally ended in 1068 AD with the Book of Highways and of Kingdoms by geographer Abu Abdullah al-Bakri. But this was just a small mention, and in practical terms, Dubai would remain lost for several more centuries. Now, sure, people occasionally made their way out there and wrote about it. We know, for example, that Venetian merchant Gasparo Balbi visited Dibay around 
1590 on a quest to buy pearls where they were reputed to be the best in the world. But it's really only in the 19th century that Dubai is yanked out of its slumber and thrust back into the global narrative. That's because the early 19th century is when one of the world's biggest colonizers and seafaring powers just decided to stop by for a bit of a visit. It's time for the British Empire to enter the picture. At the turn of the 19th century, Dubai was a small walled town squatting beside the Persian Gulf. And we mean small. There was the Al Fahidi Fort, now the oldest building in Dubai, a souk for trading, a handful of houses, and well, that was it. Yet it's amazing even this toy town existed. Its neighbors were the regional superpowers of Kawasim and Bani Yas tribes, either of whom could have gobbled it up like a whale devouring and unfortunate prophet. So, and let's not forget the pirates. In this era, the Gulf Coast was known for good reason as the Pirate Coast, with raids just a constant feature of life. Until, that is, the pirates decided to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the biggest badasses on the high seas. In 1819, the British got fed up with the pirate attacks on their Indian vessels and sent the Royal Navy in guns blazing. The pirate ships now just so much driftwood, the British promptly made the Gulf's many emirates sign a treaty meant to reduce piracy, but which basically boiled down to, we're in charge now, you're gonna have to just deal with it. Bad as this loss of sovereignty was though, the pact's existence would ultimately save Dubai. In 1833, Maktoum bin Buti rode up from Abu Dhabi, took over the port, and made the emirate his own. But rather than being the end of Dubai, story. This was just the beginning. Maktoum bin Buti wasn't conquering the port for Abu Dhabi. He wanted an independent Dubai. So he established its royal family, the Al Maktoum dynasty, and then he cozied up to the British so hard that it must have felt like he was trying to snuggle in with the entire empire. And this was an astute play. London wanted a peaceful coast with pliant rulers. With the Maktums on side, they had no interest in seeing anyone else take over their emirate. And so began the long era of Dubai as a British vassal. Like the other emirates, it was never formally colonized, retaining quite a lot of independence. But quite a lot isn't the same as total, and the British first took over maritime security, then foreign policy, then forced exclusive trade rights upon it. Eventually, this series of British-led truces would become so central that the Gulf nations became known as the Trucial States. Not that this was actually a problem for Dubai. The emirate was too busy turning itself into a major player to worry. The first step came during the reign of a long name Haver and excellent facial hair possessor Sheikh Maktoum bin Hasha al Maktoum. So good they named him twice. It was Sheikh long name double name who made Dubai a duty free port, who invited in traders from Persia, building the Al Fahidi historic district for them. By the time he died in 1905, the population of his emirate had hit an all time high of 10,000, while its economy now rivaled that of Abu Dhabi's. This is the Dubai we met in the introduction, a pearl trading port that was small, yes, but already would have been unrecognizable to anyone from the pre-British era. But if people thought this new Dubai was booming, they wouldn't believe the boom that came next. First, though, everyone was going to have to live through a bit of a major bust. In 1930, a bunch of Japanese scientists declared success in their totally dickish mission to culture pearls, and the Dubai pearl industry collapsed overnight. If that wasn't bad enough, the effects of the 1929 Wall Street crash almost simultaneously hit the region, and Dubai was plunged into, well, two whole decades of misery. It also didn't help that World War II saw the town's last lifeline trade with British India cut off by the fighting. By the time Hitler finally did the decent thing and shot Hitler, Dubai was stagnant, depressed, and in desperate need of change. But make no mistake, change was coming, and it would be summed up with three sweet little letters O, I, and L. The post war era got off to a bit of a bad start. In 1947, a border skirmish between Dubai and Abu Dhabi threatened to erupt into a full-on regional catastrophe until good old Britain intervened. But then, just as the emirate was at its lowest, luck 
suddenly changed. The first boost Dubai got was when Britain decided to locate its trucial state headquarters there. Now, basically, playing host to a bunch of colonial overlords may not sound like super fun times, but it was actually surprisingly advantageous. Being the British Empire and all, London poured infrastructure money into Dubai. Buildings were hooked up to electricity, telephone cables were installed, and even an airport was built. It was Dubai's first facelift since the pearl industry collapsed, and it was not going to stop there. The second boost the Emirate got came in 1958 with Abu Dhabi's discovery of oil. Again, this might sound counterintuitive. You can easily imagine people in Dubai being like, oh man, a big aggressive neighbor got oil? That blows. <laughs> But make no mistake, this was actually really, really good news. Over the next few years, Dubai cashed in on Abu Dhabi's oil boom with all the ingenuity of a guy in a gold rush selling shovels. Sheikh Rashid dredged Dubai Creek to allow modern tankers through, meaning all the oil industry goods bound for portless Abu Dhabi went through his emirate first. He helped his neighbors procure steel and concrete, made sure Dubai was always there and always willing to help its old rival exploit its new resource. As the oil fields grew, so did the Dubai economy, getting fat off its neighbor's success. This alone would have constituted a boom, but good luck comes in threes and Dubai's third piece of fortune would be the biggest yet. And of course, that's discovery of its own oil reserves. Uncovered in 1966, the oil fields of Dubai were exporting by 1969. By 1970, the town was drowning in petrodollars, and Sheikh Rashid was determined to reinvest all of it. Even today, the Jebel Ali port remains one of the largest on Earth. Back in the 1970s, it was an absolute monster. And this was a monster surrounded by a tax and duty-free zone that would spark a massive influx of foreign cash. But before work could begin, Dubai would have to survive a major change. Back in October 1964, two years before Dubai's oil reserves were discovered, an election in Britain had returned the first Labour government in 13 years. By now, the British Empire was in its twilight. From 700 million at the dawn of 1947, its foreign subjects now totaled a mere 5 million. Then in 1966, the Labour government's defence review revealed a bit of a horrible fact. Britain was absolutely broke. Post-World War II, post the many nations that had fled the island's rainy embrace and, well, there was just no money left. And the government had a choice. It could commit to maintaining troops across the remnants of the empire, or it could spend that money at home. And just like that, the fate of the Trucial States and newly prosperous Dubai was sealed. And if you'd like to become newly prosperous, well, start a business, get a website, build that website with Squarespace, and you're all good, not a guarantee. Two simple things, though. Maybe you've got an idea for a website or a business or a YouTube channel or a podcast or something else up there in your mind, and you're like, mmm. I should try that, but I don't know if I can because I just don't have the skills to put together a website. Well, the second thing is the only way to find out whether that idea is any good is to get it out there to the world. And the good news is you can build a website with Squarespace. It's insanely easy. Indeed, I've got another channel called Mega Projects. I just put together the whole Mega Projects website on Squarespace, and you can visit it at megaprojects.net. And bear in mind, I am an absolutely design incompetent person. I couldn't design something good if, well, actually I could because on Squarespace they designed it for me and then I just customized it in my own ways and made it look how I wanted. I probably made it worse, but it still looks amazing. Squarespace allow you to create a powerful website for whatever you're up to. Sell something online? Yes. Do a podcast? Yes. Do a blog which has mega projects articles on it? Totally easy. And once you've gone through that easy customization process, there's no updates, there's no patches, there's no tech BS to deal with, and let's just say, that I've used another very popular website hosting platform in the past before, and there are all sorts of complicated websites and updates and all that nonsense that I didn't understand and eventually it just stopped working, so I went to Squarespace. Also, Squarespace handles all the website-y stuff, mailing lists, social integrations, all of that stuff. It's all very good and 24-7 customer support in case you get stuck. So what do you need to do? Just go to squarespace.com, you get a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash geographics and you'll save 10% of your first purchase of a website or a domain. And let's get back to it. Oh, and plug within a plug, check out the other channel mega projects.
The first warning sign of the major geopolitical shift underway came from the south of Arabia. Since 1963, the Aden emergency in what is now Yemen had seen attacks of British troops stationed in the protectorate. But in 1967, those attacks suddenly went a bit supernova. Faced with unrest in a colony they couldn't hold on to and no longer really wanted, the British abandoned it in November of that year. Up in the Trucial states, everyone started nervously glancing sidelong at one another, no one daring to say it aloud, but everyone sort of thinking the same thing. If the British could just ditch Aiden like a Tinder date gone bad, what was to stop them doing the same to them? Sat here in the 21st century, you might be thinking that they were thinking, well, hooray, no more drunk Brits who just endlessly talk about Brexit, or whatever they talked about back then. But, well, no one in Dubai was actually happy. They were actually rather scared. Just six years earlier, Britain's slow distancing of itself from Kuwait had very nearly led to an Iraqi invasion. If a power vacuum in tiny Kuwait had nearly sparked a war, imagine what could happen in a British-less Gulf. Initially, London tried to allay these fears, redeploying aid and troops to the Trusal states. But then November the 18th, 1967 rolled around and all hell broke loose. That day, Prime Minister Harold Wilson made the shock decision to sharply devalue the pound. Suddenly, Whitehall was looking at foreign defense bills that it just could no longer pay. The message to the Trusal states was clear. It was over. Dubai and the others, they were soon going to be on their own. This wasn't a happy casting off of the British yoke. Dubai and Abu Dhabi actually offered to pay the costs of keeping British soldiers stationed on their soil. But they were rather snivelly told that Britain didn't very much like the idea of being a sort of white slaver for the Arab sheiks. And that was that. Still, the withdrawal wasn't instant. The Trusil states were given three years before their security guarantee vanished in a haze of tea fumes. On February the 18th, 1968, Sheikh Rashid and his Abu Dhabi counterpart Sheikh Zayed met in the desert to discuss what to do. It was at this meeting Zayed proposed merging their two emirates into a single federation. From this one suggestion, the modern Gulf would be born. As the clock ticked down to Britain's withdrawal, Dubai and Abu Dhabi tried to convince their fellow Trucial states to form a single country. At one point, it even looked like Bahrain and Qatar might come on board. Ultimately, they decided to go it alone, but that still left five other emirates sat at the table. On December 1, 1971, the Union Jack was lowered over the Trucial states for the last time. The next morning, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Fajaira, Ajman, Shahar, and Umm al Quwain joined into the United Arab Emirates, or UAE. Just two months later, the Emirate of Ras al Khaimah would join them, bringing the total number up to seven. It was an unlikely federation, still the only one of its kind in the Middle East. But it was also necessary. If you look at a map of the UAE, you see it's riddled with enclaves and messy borders. Dubai, for example, includes a seemingly random chunk of land called Hatta that's 134 kilometers away and requires crossing at least two other emirates to reach it. Had the emirates not succeeded in banding together, it's all too easy to see how it could have led to well, a spot of war. Naturally, the head of this new federation was Abu Dhabi, by far the biggest emirate, accounting for a staggering 87% of the UAE's territory. But while Abu Dhabi had the size, Dubai still had the economic power. Even as the five other emirates were drawn into an increasingly federal structure, Dubai was left to do, effectively, whatever it wanted. And what Dubai wanted to do was build like crazy. By the time Sheikh Rashid died in 1990, Dubai was starting to get something of its modern flavor. The first high-rises were going up, money was pouring in, and vast immigrant communities were toiling away to make the city great. Yet it still wasn't quite there, it still wasn't quite the Dubai that we know today. To create that Dubai, it would take two visionary people, Sheikh Maktoum, the new ruler, and his brother, Sheikh Mohammed. Together, they would turn this bustling port town into a miracle of glass and steel. Maktoum hoped to wean Dubai's economy off oil and onto the next big craze, tourism. To that end, he gave Mohammed permission to utterly transform the city, and transform it, he utterly did. It was from Sheikh Mohammed that Dubai took its ethos of build it and they will come. Emphasis very much on the build it part there. Under his watch, Dubai blitzed on luxury accommodation on western-friendly places like bars and restaurants. Massive malls were erected with world-class shopping facilities and over a million dollars in giveaways. In no time at all, the first tourists were not just showing up, but raving about what they had found. 
In response, Dubai just kept on building. In 1999, the gigantic Burj Al Arab opened, supposedly the only seven-star hotel in the world. Three years later, in 2002, Dubai threw its doors open to property investors, and the Gulf's biggest ever construction boom began. It's dizzying to just list some of the things that appeared in Dubai overnight. Golf courses, racing tracks, vast swimming pools, luxury restaurants, ice rinks, expensive spas, and designer stores, they all popped up in just months. New hotels also blossomed, adding 7,000 new rooms a year. And that was just down the normal end of the scale. At the other end, things were going crazy. One of the craziest was likely Ski Dubai, a gigantic resort with man-made snow, multiple slopes, and different trails, all somehow existing in the heart of a burning desert. Forget the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Where an ancient writer yanked forward in time and deposited in Dubai's ski slopes, they would declare it the greatest wonder of the world. Yet, compared to what else Dubai was up to in the early 21st century, a magic desert snow house was positively restrained. Offshore, the property developer Nakhil was undertaking a land reclamation project so ostentatious it seemed like fantasy. Huge islands were built that looked like palm trees. Further offshore, Nakhil created an entire chain of islands designed to look like a map of the world. In short, it was a crazy time, but also a highly lucrative one. In 2005, the Dubai International Financial Exchange opens the first international stock exchange in the Middle East. A year and a half later, Halliburton upped sticks from Texas and headquartered itself in Dubai. By the time the unfinished Burj Khalifa was awarded the title of world's tallest structure in 2007, it must have seemed like the good times were never going to end. But while Dubai would very much remain a byword for glitz and glamour, storm clouds were already gathering. When the rains finally came, they would risk washing the entire emirate away. <laughs> On September 15, 2008, US banking giant Lehman Brothers collapsed under the weight of its own hubris. It was the start of the financial crisis, and it would upend absolutely everything. The shock of the crisis blew through Dubai like a Siberian wind. Construction projects froze, never to be completed. Vast building sites were abandoned. Even the world archipelago, that ultimate symbol of the Dubai boom, was scuppered. Today, 12 years later, its islands remain woefully unused. As the crisis peaked in 2009, Dubai did the only thing it could. On the brink of a default, it called in the cavalry. Abu Dhabi bailed out its little brother, but the humiliation had stung pretty bad. It took until 2011 for Dubai to finally escape the crisis. Even then, though, things never returned to their crazy pre-crash heights. Still, by 2014, normal service was resuming. Real estate prices had reached an all-time high, and the city could continue to rely on tourism to generate massive piles of cash. In fact, had this video been made around 2015, we'd likely have written off the financial crisis as a mere blip in Dubai's history, a painful pause in its ever-continuing success story. But events of the last five years have made that hypothetical ending impossible. In that short span of time, Dubai has suffered three potentially devastating crises. The first came in 2014, as oil prices entered a profound slump that they've still not recovered from. The second was a near simultaneous drop in real estate prices, which tumbled 30% from their 2014 highs, effectively ending Dubai's build it and they will come ethos. Come late 2019, Dubai was posting its lowest growth since the financial crisis. Experts were already warning that the city was vulnerable to a shock. But still, there were some rays of sunshine. Expo 2020 was guaranteed to bring millions of visitors to the city, all of them splashing around bundles of cash. I mean, it's not like 2020 was going to be the year international tourism became suddenly impossible, right? The disaster began on January the 29th, 2020. That day, the UAE recorded its first case of COVID-19, and, well, you can probably guess what happened next. The pandemic shut down and devastated Dubai. For a hyper-social city built on tourism, trade, retail, and construction, the coronavirus was like kryptonite. Whereas Abu Dhabi's heavy industry and huge reserves saw it mostly unaffected, Dubai slashed salaries by 75%, laid off over a quarter of a million, and faced a mass exodus of immigrants that could see its population shrink by as much as 10%. Despite the city now reopening, the economic hit is expected to be enormous. Of course, since we're making this last section as this is actually happening, something 
something we normally try to avoid, we can't say how things are going to shake out. But it seems likely that Abu Dhabi will have to ride to the rescue of its old rival again, the second time in 12 years. Only this time, the concession's big brother demands could knock Dubai off its perch for good. So, well, that's the story of Dubai then. A story in which the final chapter is still being written and the ending remains very uncertain. It could be that the Emirate bounces back from this like it did after the collapse of the pearl industry or after the financial crisis. Or it could be that Dubai's dizzying rise properly ended back in 2008 and we're still now just witnessing its drawn out fall. Whatever the truth, it seems unlikely that Dubai is destined to slip into obscurity anytime soon. Here is a city that's a monument to capitalism, an impossible dream gleaming in the desert. A modern boomtown, yes, but also one with a deep and fascinating history. Dubai in 2020 may be on the ropes, but if our story today has taught us anything, it's that this place, this one little chunk of coast on the edge of a desert, is a survivor. If anywhere I can beat the odds to once again rise from the ashes, it's here. So I really hope you found this video interesting. If you did, smash that like button. Don't forget to subscribe. Support this show by supporting our fantastic sponsor Squarespace. Link below. Thank you for watching.